is a real pleasure for me. You may not know this. If you're at the VIP breakfast, you do. Kevin and I have known each other for, I think, 31, maybe 32 years. And uh, it's very rare in this industry. We're both from the bond business. That's the backstory. So there's a lot of that going on. But uh, one, one thing I wanted to share before we get started from uh, Kevin and from the Acreage team, they're in a quiet period. So uh, we'll have a lot to talk about, but there's some things I'm not able to address. And we'll have some time for uh, Q&A maybe at the end. So keep that in mind, he can't make comments on stuff like that. So it was uh, literally the last Benzinga conference. Who, who was there in Toronto? Anybody? Nobody was in Toronto? A few people, okay, well that's cool. It's a good reason to do it in Chicago also. It was literally at the last Benzinga conference that the cannabis industry was rocked. Uh, it was uh, right at the end of the trading day, uh, so four o'clock their time, and uh, one of the Nigerian brothers starts talking about uh, canopy growth buying acreage. And so it was a little convoluted and the price was a little off, but the reality was just six months ago, the whole industry was rocked. And, and so we'll talk a little bit about this, but uh, so getting into this landmark deal, Kevin, so much has happened since then, since then and uh, we'll talk more about the deal itself, but I want to talk now about the stage of development. You and I had a conversation a couple of months ago uh, about how your company's stage of development had advanced. And uh, I want you to kind of walk the, the audience through sure. that in terms of how Acreage has changed from an early stage to, to more of a operational company. Sure. Well, I would say the, uh, in jest, uh, as my general counsel had said, geez, Murph, I don't know if you should be doing the conference because we're in a quiet period. And I said, well, I, I, can, I can frankly work around it. He said, well, the thing that makes me nervous is in a quiet period, it's really hard for you to stay quiet. So, <laughs> Um, thrilled to be here with all of you, and uh, it's a real honor and, and a pleasure to be here, Benzenga, and, and, and frankly, thanks for the gracious invitation. Uh, <clears throat> just as a, as a brief bit of history, and I think it really sets the table for the rest of the conversation, uh, for you that hadn't been at the, uh, this morning's um, breakfast meeting, um, I had, prior to being in the cannabis space, uh, as Alan had noted, uh, my business was predominantly in the bond business and morphed over uh, a number of years into the corporate bond business. I was fortunate to be an investment banker for many, many years and then um, was fortunate to start my own firm in the late 90s. We had had some, uh, a terrific successful run in that um, and I'll tell you quite candidly and frankly it's not a gratuitous attempt at being humble the way in which we grew it from zero to north of $30 billion under management is because we started with an extraordinary partner. And that partner at the time was XL Reinsurance. And the conversation went something like this. You know, I'd really like to invest capital for you. And, you know, friends and family would say, Murph, when you get to a couple hundred million bucks, give me a call. Well, I'm calling you because I need the couple hundred million bucks. <laughs> um, XL was gracious enough to give us $500 million of investable capital which jettisoned our business, which ultimately gets us to where we frankly are today. But I was able to monetize on that business, became a private investor, and then got involved with cannabis in 2011. Very, very early on, I was invited to participate in the first state, Maine, which was the first state east of Mississippi to really embrace cannabis from a medicinal uh, basis. Learned very quickly from that uh, experience to ultimately have the opportunity to then go and vie for additional licenses in the New England area. But initially, my foray into the space was just make a couple investments, try not to lose too much money, and move on to the next investment. When I started to learn more and more about the medicinal value of the plant, more and more about the veteran we helped or the child with Dravet syndrome that we helped, I had a change of heart and went really all into the space. So we've morphed from um, family investments that I had made for the first three years of our existence to affectionately calling ourselves High Street Capital, kind of a clever name, right? Kind of an English tone to it. Um, and from there, we, we were more of an investment company making more and more investments more larger investments, and then ultimately in 2018, when we had invited a number of high-profile folks to join our board of directors, namely Speaker John Boehner, 
Governor Bill Weld, Prime Minister Mulroney, um, coupled that with a number of other uh, tremendous business leaders, Larissa Herta, chairwoman from Time Warner Media, uh, Bill Von Fossen, chairman of Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, and the ex-CFO of IBM, Doug Main. And the reason I had put that board together was very simply, we surrounded this organization with, I thought, high quality executives. Now it's time to put together um, a terrific board of directors because I felt at the time and still do today that this business is really at the cross section of commerce and regulation. And I thought it was a very balanced board of directors to really speak to both of those um, uh, vectors. Um, we had changed our name to Acreage Holdings. We had uh, the good fortune of listing on the CSE, not welcome here in the US to date, um, and ultimately which led to an arrangement with Canopy um, where when it is federally permissible in the United States, I believe that is a state's banking type of legislative, um, we will have the ability to become one, but until that time, we will oper operate independently, but we will also enjoy, while we're waiting, all of the things that they've spent hundreds of millions of dollars on to really reappropriate here in the United States. So that's where we are today. This is a binding agreement. We're, we have to do it and they have to do it when it is federally permissible, federally legal, but um, we couldn't be more excited about the transaction when it had taken place. And I couldn't be more excited about the transaction today of which I'm sure we'll get into in more detail. So how is the organization transitioning, though, to becoming more operational now? I think uh, sure. there's been a subtle change in, in your approaches with some turnover in employees. There so what's is. going on inside of Acreage? I think, you know, whenever you grow from, uh, you know, one person making investments for a couple of years to, you know, three guys and gals in a garage to making more and more investments, um, the business itself continues to grow. Um, you know, frankly, whether we have the right people at the right time, right? And so I think every business transitions from an entrepreneurial stage to um, an early operating stage to a more mature business to ultimately a full-blown CPG company. Um, many people look to Acreage and, and, and identify Acreage with Kevin Murphy. Today, it has virtually nothing to do with Kevin Murphy. It has everything to do with the 950 plus people that we have in our organization. That's what Acreage is really all about. If I left tomorrow, I'm sure I'd be missed, but in fact, I'm sure they'd carry on and do exceedingly well. And so from our vantage point, it's been a privilege to be a part of it. It's been a privilege to continue to be a part of it. Um, and along the way, we've had people that have served us very, very well early on, less well as we've morphed into a more uh, mature business. And so today, uh, again, we'll probably have additional changes. Um, I can assure you all for the better. Great. And uh, back to uh, Canopy Growth, obviously uh, some changes there uh, and Constellations uh, exerting their will in the business, it appears. And are you able to address how the relationship has or has not changed between Canopy mm. Growth, given that Constellation's more involved in that company now? Well, I think that when a company shows up for $4, $4 billion, you know, they, gotta, they wanna say, right? And so I think that that's a reasonable request. Um, I've had the very, very good fortune of developing an extraordinary relationship uh, with Bruce Linton. I think he's a world-class guy, world-class operator, and frankly, um, you know, I, I really honor that relationship. And I think that um, as uh, he had created Canopy, and I think one of the amazing strengths of Bruce is he was able to many, many years ago see the possibility of what this business could be in the future. Very few people have the ability to have that vision and that foresight. Steve Jobs comes to mind, Bill Gates comes to mind, Michael Dell comes to mind, an old friend of yours. Um, but you either possess it or you don't. 
I also know humbly that he probably believes that he may not be the best CPG guy. And so, as I've stated, you know, acreage is as much about the people um, as it is about me. And I think Canopy is the house that um, Bruce had built and created. And, you know, I, it's a privilege to be helping them build that brick by brick going forward. Now, you know, from here, we did a deal with Canopy Growth. Now, I mean, certainly I did the deal personally with Bruce, but nothing has changed whatsoever. As a matter of fact, Constellation uh, is supremely excited about not only the relationship with acreage, um, but the prospects for the regulated market here in the United States, given it's roughly 10 times the opportunity in Canada. And so again, we are lockstep with them um, from a mindset standpoint, uh, although we are um, independent until we have the opportunity from a legal standpoint to come together. So uh, we've been hit with a capital crunch uh, in, in the sector. Uh, hard to predict in advance, but clearly uh, in full force right now. I'm just wondering, how is acreage, I mean, using it to its advantage, or how is it challenging you? What, what is your view on this whole capital crunch that we're facing? I shared the quote this morning, and I guess it's probably appropriate to, to share it again, given that many of you may not have been present at this morning's conversation. And I think Warren Buffett was the one that coined the phrase, and I think appropriately, and I'm probably paraphrasing. And, um, but he stated at one point that the stock market is the only market when it goes on sale, people run for the doors. Pretty thoughtful, right? So given the fact that I'm probably an elder statesman in the cannabis space, um, you know, and I, and I think I feel pretty good for my age, and it's probably the <laughs> CBD, but, um, but the fact of the matter is that I've lived through the crash of the late 80s, saw the crisis in the early 90s, capitalized on the crisis in 98, and actually was one of the participants on the uh, short side in 2007. So in turn, I've seen a lot of ebbs and flows in capital markets. If you had bought Thrifty Car Rental, and I cited this this morning, at 45 cents in 2008, you could have sold it for $45 four years later. And there are many stories like that. You know, when Solomon Brothers got into trouble, they called Warren Buffett. When Goldman Sachs, many, many years later, got in trouble, they called, that's weird, Warren Buffett. And when you can think about where we are today in this opportunity, because I have never had a lower share price, I've never been more optimistic. Now, about the industry, Howard. <laughs> I know we're in a quiet period. But the fact of the matter is, you know, this is exciting times for us. Six months ago, I came together with, with, with what I believe to be the best combination of efforts in the cannabis space. A global leader in Canopy with a big brother in Constellation. We had always aspired to be international, but we were too busy on the US. This affords us that opportunity to be a global powerhouse. But in fact, get three people in a room, it gets a little political, and there's you know, some naysayers, and you know, you know, there's a lot of, frankly, naysayers in this world, in this business in particular. You sold out, capped your upside, you know, and on and on, right? We see, I don't look at this business, although as a CEO and chairman of a public company, I know we're graded quarter to quarter to quarter, but see, I'm the guy that looks five years 10 years out, and I see where we're going, the fastest growing industry, not only in the US, but globally. On the heels of the House, voting 321 votes in favor of safe banking, when we were praying months before that for 290 to pass with suspension. But that's where we are today, with 95% of the country believing in the medicinal value of this plant, and 60 7% in the recreational benefits of this plant. And now politicians are listening. So on the heels of that amazing 
wonderful news, we've never had a stock market in cannabis in more disarray. One of the reasons why I did the deal with Canopy was not to cap our upside, because I know we have more upside from here. As a fiduciary and a keeper of capital, I'm always looking at the downside. Back to my corporate credit world, all I did was lend money and try to get it back with a modicum of interest. And I can promise you this, I'm gonna prove that we have the lowest cost of capital in the industry. And when you have capital in disarray in markets like this, good news. Sadly, there are many companies today in this business that will not exist going forward. MySpace was awesome. Facebook was better. So in, you know, in light of you know, being, uh, you know, hindsight's a 2020 teacher, right? You can look back and it, it's a pretty good teacher. But if you've lived long enough and you've lived through enough of the downturn, you clearly see the backside of it. And again, my optimistic uh, view uh, has never been higher. So when you guys did the deal, one of the big selling points was your ability to do M&A. And the market's changed since then. And I know you're in a quiet period. You can't tell us, well, we <laughs> talked to so-and-so. But uh, can you at least address, is yeah. this still a part of, uh, of the plan? And what is holding up? Is it just the capital crunch or well, the other Well, I issues? think that, yes. I think if you, if you have the optimism that I have and you see your stock as commerce to do deals, then you're, you know, do I want to do a deal at this price? Mm -hmm. But I think that, you know, when, when things get difficult and markets are more challenging, all you need to do is adjust your thinking. When you talk about cheap cost of capital, it doesn't necessarily mean equity. It could mean debt. It could mean seller notes. It could mean a whole host of things in order to get a deal done. There's been, a, I think, a very healthy sense of humility weaved back into this business, right? Everyone thinks that the world of cannabis is paved with gold, get a license, make some money, flip it, you know, it's all good. Then when it comes to operating a business and having HR issues and frankly, transforming your business from an investment business to an operating business, that's when it gets a little trickier. And so I think you need to be very clever on the M&A side. How do we do deals without compromising the shareholders that have <clears throat> basically instilled their confidence in you um, at higher markets and bought in at higher markets? Well, you, what you do is you try to do deals with less dilution. You try to do deals that are, frankly, more accretive and truly message to your acquisition that it's a one plus one equals four or five. My values come down, yours has come down. Let's together join forces and be that much better off for it in four to five years. Where I believe we have an advantage, and it's not a Machiavellian view, and don't, you know, frankly misconstrue my statement says, you know, we're, we're going to be the, the green, uh, Grim Reaper in this business. But the conversation goes something like this. We're going to be a survivor because we've got rich uncles. You, on the other hand, jury's out. We can be your opportunity to exist and live to fight another day and be a part of a greater and larger organization. That's how you get deals done in this business and in this environment. Again, proving to the other side that this is an accretive transaction and that they should be, and we should be fortunate to be tied at the hip. So I know forward guidance got to be careful here, but the m and is still a big part of, of <clears throat> your plans. That's what we do. Okay. Uh, switching gears, uh, I don't think any, anybody uh, more than you and your company are plugged into uh, national politics the way you are. Uh, can you walk through just very briefly so we can get to another question? The uh, states, the, the Safe Banking Act, states, sure. right? Mm -hmm the States Act and uh, even 280E, kind of what's your view on the timing of these things playing out, if at all? Too many people in this country want cannabis reform. It's that simple, okay? So if I'm a politician and I'm in Pennsylvania and I'm at that podium and I want to get elected, I'm talking coal miners, coal, you know, got to bring back coal, right? Got to be independent. Cannabis today employs more people than the coal industry. Fact. And as we continue to grow, and as we continue to have a greater voice, 
We're, we, sh we need to be entitled to safe banking. You want to grow an illicit business, make it a cash business, right? Counterintuitive to any politician that frankly wants to keep it safe, right? Soccer mom's locking up her dispensary in Colorado. People believe that she has cash and you know, gets rolled at the light. That's a problem. It's a safety issue and that has to be addressed. We've been fortunate as a very large MSO and some of the other MSOs as well, we have banking. We don't need safe banking. If I was, again, taking a Machiavellian view, I'd say we don't care about safe banking because we have all the money we need. It's everybody else that's going to get washed out. But that's not our view. Our view is we need to keep people safe in this business. We need to empower minorities to get access to capital so they can grow their businesses because make no mistake about it. Social is a big, big part of cannabis. And if you don't have available capital, you can just forget about you know, social inequality because it's just not going to exist. It's going to be rich will get richer. And frankly, the poor just need not apply. And so we're you know, on the heels of, uh, or on the forefront of making a major announcement on that front because we are believers that everyone needs to be afforded an opportunity to participate in this space. And I'll tell you, that's, I couldn't be more excited about that than, frankly, the other things that we've got going on. Is safe banking? Uh, safe, safe is very straightforward. States, is that going to yeah, pass Yeah, states soon? is a little bit more challenging. Yeah. States is make it federally permissible in the states that currently have laws. Straight down the fairway, pretty simple, right? I mean, Connecticut, shouldn't I be out of harm's way, right? Strengthen the Tenth Amendment to, you know, Mitch McConnell. Let's be a conservative Republican. You know, you're a Constitution guy, or you're a libertarian. You know, leave it to the states, like our forefathers, you know, kind of intended it to be. Now, unfortunately, you have that states being a little bit diluted with, you know, what's the social component? What's the expungement component? Which doesn't necessarily resonate with most Republicans, eh, you know, you're caught trafficking 50 pounds of cannabis, eh, you know, I mean, where do you draw the line? So it gets confusing as to add more to what already exists as a clean path, it gets a little bit confusing, and I, you know, I'm probably a little less optimistic as to what the timing might be there, given the MORE Act is a part of it now, and all the rest of it. My view, and it's just a personal view, pass the States Act, leave it to the states to then go in and say, I'm going to expunge records here. I'm the governor of Massachusetts. I'm going to see to it that we're going to basically, you know, let these folks out of jail and frankly expunge their records. All right, finally, on the states uh, uh, aspect, uh, New York, New Jersey, maybe Pennsylvania, all, these are all very close to legalizing. Florida, the voters are going to get a chance again. Connecticut. Uh, Connecticut. Too. Uh, so that was my next question. What are some of the markets that you, you think are not only going to legalize, but that are going to be great markets? I think that, that tri-state area is going to be an amazing market. I think the governors of those states are very, very smart in getting together to try to understand where each other state is kind of shaking out. No state wants to be in a situation where they set a tax code and the guy next door is, you know, 10% cheaper and then you know, you've got, uh, the only guy that's making money is Easy Pass, right? So, I mean, I think <laughs> at the end of the day, um, this is another example of governors now getting together and say, hey, I, I'm the CEO of my state. I want to manage this state the way the people of that state have, frankly, legislated me to, 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 to manage that state. And so now when you have this, um, this, this coming together to try to figure it out as one, that is positive messaging, which makes, to me, that tri-state area supremely exciting. Um, obviously, uh, there are other states that have done it well, uh, other states that have done it less well. But the one frustration in this business is that, you know, every day you wake up, it's something else. It's, you know, <laughs> I mean, you know, and, you know, the latest was Nevada. Okay, we're going to put a halt on all transactions taking place and new licenses because... You know, who knows? Someone's trying to affect an election. I mean, it's, it's a challenging business. I had a full head of hair when I started in 2011. <laughs> Follicle challenge Black. today. Yeah, I know, I know. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, but the fact is that uh, 
I couldn't be more excited about it, couldn't be more excited about the participation here with all these folks. And listen, you know, we don't see, uh, you know, the, the medicine vans or the Crescos or the GTIs or the, the, the Livewells or uh, the other companies out there as our competitors. They're not. We're all in this together. We're huddling for heat. It's the illicit market. It's the folks that are actually unregulated, that are basically trying to be more profitable by, you know, putting out product that's not regulated. Frankly, maybe some of it has acetate, maybe some of it has, but, you know, nobody's checking. Why not just, frankly, leads to better margins? It leads to unsafe, unpredictable, and sadly, deaths. And so from our vantage point, you know, I'm, I'm a libertarian at heart, but I think that there needs to be some rules and regulations, sure. and there needs to be a fairer tax code, and that's what I'm working on every month in Washington, not only for ourselves, but for everyone else in this business. It's a zero, you know, it's not a zero sum game. We get things done in Washington, everyone here participates to the upside. Very similar to John Boehner joining our board. I think everyone participated in an upswing there on the heels of Jeff Sessions simply stating, you know, you know I don't think it should be legal and John joined us two months later, which is good news. So. You know, thanks again for the time, and I wish everybody, all the entrepreneurs out there, best of luck, you know, and, and you know, hard hats on. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Next time, we'll be talking about the upswing. <laughs>